On the broadcast tonight, South Korea continues to insist that reunions of families separated during the Korean War and a resumption of a mountain tourism project be dealt with as two separate matters. But Seoul leaves the door open for talks on the Mount Kimgang tour project if some conditions are met. Political wrangling over privatization part two. And this one has to do with the medical sector. Korea's opposition party claims that President Park's latest attempt to ease regulations in the sector points to privatization, setting up another political battle. And in New Jersey scandal, New Jersey governor and potential Republican presidential contender Chris Christie fires an aide who allegedly organized an act of political revenge that has threatened his political career. This is Early Edition at 6. It is 4 a.m. in Trenton, New Jersey, 5 p.m. in Beijing, and 6 on a Friday evening here in Seoul. Welcome to Early Edition at 6 a.m. Moon Gonyo. And I'm Daniel Chan. Thank you for joining us. We begin with both Koreas trying to meet halfway, I believe. That is correct. South Korea is making efforts to keep the friendly inter-Korean vibe alive that was uh, created by the leaders of the two Koreas through their cordial New Year's address. It says it's willing to discuss the resumption of an inter-Korean tourism project near Mount Kumgang if North Korea makes an official request. Our handout starts us off. Seoul's Unification Ministry says South Korea is willing to talk with the North about resuming tours to the Mount Kumgang Resort. If North Korea makes a proposal that includes specific dates, I think the two Koreas can have a discussion on the halted Mount Kumgang tours. Friday's remarks came one day after Pyongyang turned down Seoul's offer for talks on reunions for families separated by the Korean War. The North questioned how the humanitarian event could be held right before annual South Korea-U.S. joint military drills set for February. The reclusive state also said that before the two Koreas can discuss the reunions, they must address issues that have been raised by the North in the past. That is assumed to include a resumption of tours to the Mount Kumgang Resort. Ministry spokesman Kim Uido, however, reiterated that the Mount Kumgang tourism and family reunion issues should be dealt with separately. He said the two issues are not linked and that there is no change in Seoul's insistence that North Korea should first claim responsibility for shooting a South Korean tourist dead in 2008. The spokesman also urged North Korea to show sincerity about Seoul's offer for talks if it truly wants improved ties with the South. Resuming family reunions is the first step towards a new inter-Korean relationship. Political watchers point out that although the upcoming South Korea-U.S. military exercises are likely to be a major hurdle in resuming inter-Korean dialogue, the two Koreas have not completely ruled out the possibility of future negotiations. And then, I did a news. South Korea and the United States have struck a deal on how much Seoul should contribute towards the stationing of U.S. troops here. According to the agreement reached on Friday, Seoul will be paying roughly 900 million U.S. dollars, which is 50 million dollars more than the amount Korea had originally offered. Sources say the two sides also agreed to renew the special measures agreement every five years so that it coincides with the length of each administration's term in Korea. The previously agreed upon terms for defense cost sharing plans expired last week. Shifting our focus, China has accused Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of siding with the convicted war criminals over the United Nations following his recent visit to the Yasukuni Shrine as the Japanese war dead honored there include more than a dozen Class A war criminals. Our Kim Hyun Bin reports. China has taken its diplomatic route with Japan to the United Nations, questioning Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's distorted view on history after he visited a shrine commemorating several notorious war criminals. China's Yuan envoy Lu Ji Yi says Abe was siding with convicted war criminals over the UN by visiting the Yasukuni Shrine, which he said whitewashes and glorifies Japan's wartime aggression. It is a dangerous distortion of the right 
and wrong. It is also a stand on the wrong side of history. In response, Japan's UN Ambassador Motohide Yoshikawa said Abe's visit did not praise war criminals or militarism, but was a tribute to the Japanese war dead. Following talks with visiting Japanese foreign and defense ministers in Paris Thursday, French Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius said Abe's visit, although a delicate issue, was to respect the Japanese that died during the war. Abe's younger brother and senior vice foreign minister, Nobuo Kishi, will head to the U.S. next Monday to ask Washington to understand why Abe visited the shrine. During his five-day trip, Kishi is expected to meet with U.S. government officials and experts, among others. Fourteen Class A war criminals and hundred more convicted of lesser crimes are enshrined in Yaskuni, among Japan's 2.5 million war dead. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. The leaders of the ruling and main opposition parties are set to hold separate press conferences early next week, where they'll announce their policy goals for 2014. Our political correspondent Kim Hyun-ji reports on what we can expect. The ruling Senori party will hold its New Year's news conference in Seoul next Tuesday, about one week after President Park Geun-hye held her own. Senori party chief Hwang Woo-yo is expected to outline how his party intends to help President Park realize her three-year economic innovation plan. The president wants to put the country on the path to a per capita income of 40,000 U.S. dollars and a 70 percent employment rate before her term ends. With that in mind, the ruling party chief is likely to talk about how the National Assembly should support the slowly recovering economy and boost domestic demand. As the legislation of such bills requires bipartisan efforts, Huang is likely to seek help from the main opposition party. Another issue that may come up during the press conference is reunification with North Korea, which President Park described as being a jackpot in her New Year's address. On the other side of the political aisle lies the main opposition Democratic Party, whose chairman Kim An Gil will hold his New Year's press conference on Monday. Political watchers expect Kim to urge President Park and the government to communicate more effectively in 2014, both with the general public and the opposition. He's also expected to once again call on the president to launch an independent investigation into allegations that a number of state institutions, including the spy agency and the military, try to influence the outcome of the 2012 presidential election in favor of now President Park Geun-hye. Reviving the economy is also a goal of the Democratic Party, but the party wants to do it by promoting fair business practices. The Rebel Party's press conferences early next week will be the first ones held under the current leadership, and both leaders are expected to address two main issues that kept the National Assembly in a deadlock for much of last year, the policy divide between the Rebel Parties and the election manipulation scandal. Kim Hyun-ji, Arirang News. There's a new political dispute at the National Assembly. This one has to do with the medical sector. The opposition party is claiming that recent measures put forth by the Park Geun-hye administration to ease regulations in the sector are a step towards privatization. The ruling party says the DP is playing politics with the matter. Our Oh Jin-ju has the details. The first privatization dispute was centered around the state-owned railway corporation. This one is focused on the medical sector. The blame game has a political center as the ruling in opposition parties jockey for position ahead of the upcoming regional elections in June. Ruling Senate Party floor leader Che kyung hwan slammed the opposition party for spreading what he called unverified rumors and for distorting measures put forth by the Peck administration to develop the medical industry. The Democratic Party knows full well that allowing medical corporations to set up subsidiaries or providing remote medical services to patients will not increase medical expenses and has nothing to do with privatization. But the DP is trying to use it as a part of a political strategy in campaigning for the regional elections. The main opposition Democratic Party, meanwhile, pointed the finger at President Park for instigating a conflict in the medical sector so shortly after the rail strike. DP leader Kim An Gil said disregarding the public nature of medical services and viewing it as a type of commercial industry comes from, quote, pariah capitalism. 
The privatization of the medical sector will inevitably lead to a hike in the public's medical bills. Should privatization be pushed before first listening to public opinion, before the matter goes through a thorough review and debate at Parliament, it will definitely fail. The PAC administration late last year unveiled plans that would allow medical corporations to set up subsidiaries as part of efforts to ease regulations and boost investment in the medical services sector. In response, some 500 members of the Korea Medical Association are expected to meet this weekend, where they will draw up plans to go on strike as early as Monday in protest of the government's measures. Oh Jin Ju, Arirang News. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. Korea is taking its first steps towards joining the U.S.-led Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. Assistant Deputy Trade Minister Choi Kyung nim will embark on a four-nation trip starting Monday to hold a series of preliminary talks on the trade pact. Korea's trade ministry says Choi's first stop will be in Washington before traveling to Mexico, Chile and Peru. The TPP is an effort by the U.S. to increase its economic presence in the Asia-Pacific region. Negotiations for the trade deal currently involve 12 countries. Now, Korea has pledged additional support for infrastructure and economic development projects along the Mekong River in Southeast Asia. In the Laotian capital of Vientiane on Friday, a memorandum of understanding was signed at the first meeting of finance ministers from Korea and Laos. It calls on Korea to deliver of roughly 200 million U.S. dollars in development assistance as part of the Economic Development Cooperation Fund. The two countries plan to build embankments along the Mekong River for the construction of roads and bridges and seek out new business projects using the Han River in Seoul as a model. Over in the U.S., New Jersey Governor Chris Christie has fired a top aide who appears to have ordered lane closures at a key bridge connecting New Jersey and New York City last fall as political payback. Shin Zemin has more on the growing scandal that could threaten the governor's presidential aspirations. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie apologized Thursday for a growing scandal that threatens to shake his possible run for the presidency in 2016. Uh, I am embarrassed and humiliated by the conduct of some of the people on my team. There's no doubt in my mind that the conduct that they exhibited is completely unacceptable and showed a lack of respect for their appropriate role of government and for the people that we're trusted to serve. The apology follows revelations that one of his top aides may have ordered the closure of traffic lanes on the George Washington Bridge in September in what appears to be an act of revenge. The bridge connects New Jersey to New York City and is a major commuter route. The scandal broke Wednesday with the revelation of texts and emails showing that Bridget Ann Kelly, the governor's deputy chief of staff, and David Wildstein, a top executive at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which manages the George Washington Bridge, may have conspired to orchestrate the lane closure last fall. The lane closure appears to have been planned as political payback against a Democratic mayor in the state who refused to endorse Christie over his Democratic rival in his re-election bid last year. Christie announced Thursday that he fired Kelly while Weinstein resigned over the scandal early last month. The office of the U.S. attorney in New Jersey has announced it is launching an investigation into the case. Christie is a rising star in the Republican Party and a possible presidential contender in 2016. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. Now, if you've flown on an airplane any time recently, you know you're required to turn off your cell phones during takeoff and landing. But the times are changing. Following similar moves in the U.S. and Europe, Korea's transport ministry announced it will allow airline passengers to keep those electronic devices on starting as early as March. Our Yudian has the details. 
passengers lining up to get on a domestic flight. Smartphones are a popular way to kill time as people wait to depart. But those phones are forced off once on board the aircraft as it prepares to take off. That's because of safety concerns that radio signals from electronic devices could interfere with the aircraft's communication and navigation systems. But air travelers will soon be able to continue watching videos and playing games with their gadgets throughout their entire flight. Korea's Ministry of Land, Transport and Maritime Affairs announced this week that upon finishing up its safety evaluations, all portable electronic devices will be cleared for use during all stages of the flight, starting as early as March. The decision follows similar moves in the United States and Europe. But don't expect phone calls to be allowed while flying the friendly skies just yet. Making phone calls and sending messages that transmit radio waves will not be allowed. So smartphones will be able to be used as long as they're on airplane mode. People with large notebooks that take up space will be advised to stow them under their seats or in their overhead compartment during takeoff and landing. The aviation industry is welcoming the new decision and is calling for quick adoption. We hope the new decision will be adopted in the near future. We need to be more careful when considering phone calls, however. Although they have been proven to be safe, they could still cause discomfort to other passengers. With the new move, carriers are developing new services that integrates passengers' electronic devices with the in-flight experience. Yurian, Arirang News. For our final part of a week-long special series previewing policy goals for the Korean government in the new year, we'll be looking at the nation's arts and culture industry. And to tell us more, our cultural correspondent Park Ji-won joins us from the News Center. Hello there, ji -won. Hello, good evening. This is the year after the Park Geun-hye administration declared its support for the arts and culture sector, and the government has a lot planned for the upcoming year. Well, President Park, a staunch defender of culture, began the year by attending a New Year's concert last Friday, hosted by the Culture Ministry, and spent some time with prominent Korean artists and art professionals. And let's listen to what she said on the occasion. Now, ji of course, at President Park seems very enthusiastic about her goal of uh, providing greater support for culture and the arts in this country. Now, what are some of the new plans that will go into effect this year? Well, the most immediate change is that every last Wednesday of the month will be designated as a day of culture. On this day, people will be able to get discounts on admission to public cultural institutions, such as museums, art galleries, and performances. Movie theater chains will also be a part of the plan by providing discounts on movie tickets on the day. The well, sounds great. Uh, what else does the government have planned for uh, those struggling artists and uh, very hungry art lovers here in Korea? Well, well, this is all thanks to a basic law on culture that passed the National Assembly last month. The country will soon have an obligation to provide its citizens with cultural activities, and Koreans will have a right to culture. The law takes effect in March, and in line with this, the government will subsidize cultural activities for underprivileged people so that they have the opportunity to experience culture and the arts. Starting in February, people in the bottom two tax brackets will be provided with about $95 per household per month for cultural activities, with an additional $50 provided per adolescent for families with children. The money will be put on a card that can only can be used for cultural activities, domestic tourism or sports. And starting in March, the government will issue cultural passes to low-income 
youth between the ages of 18 and 24. The cards give them a discount on admission to cultural activities. The government will also launch a similar program for artists. Artists will get artist passes that entitle them to discounts on cultural events so that they still gain some inspiration from cultural activities, even if they are experiencing financial hardship. Well, one cultural ministry of Fisher had this to say about the programs. Last year was the first year that the national goal of cultural enrichment was declared. And we've done a lot of preparation to initiate cultural policies and programs for citizens. These policies will be put into practice starting this year. We hope citizens will feel there are many favorable cultural policies this year that directly affect their ability to engage in cultural activity. Well, Chiwon, all of this sounds very, very good and very uh, beneficial. But of course, uh, the budget is always a problem in order to fund uh, these programs. Now, I understand the government aims to increase the annual budget for cultural programming every year. Yes. One of the President Park's election pledges was to increase the national budget for culture and the arts to about 2 percent by 2017, which is the OECD average. And the government has kept that promise. Well, this year, more than $4 billion will be allocated to culture and the arts, or 1.24 percent of the total government budget uh, from last year's 1.2 percent. Well, this is what the culture ministry's um, financial officer had to say about the increase. While the total government budget has increased by about 3.7 percent, Compared to last year, the culture budget has increased by some 7.7 percent, a much higher rate than the average increase from year to year for the state budget as a whole. This year's budget includes funds for promotion of the study of humanities, the establishment of a cultural center for people who are physically challenged, the launch of a new cultural tourism center in Paris, and a stronger financial safety net for artists. Well, we've covered a lot today, but Jiwon, before we let you go, what are some of the highlights on the performance calendar this year? Well, this year marks the birth of some of the world's most well-known artists. Well, this year is the 450th anniversary of Shakespeare's birth. National and local theater companies around the country plan to celebrate with presentations of the playwrights' masterpieces throughout the year. On the music front, 2014 is also the 150th anniversary of German composer Richard Strauss's birthday. The Seoul Philharmonic Orchestra will present many Strauss works this year, and the orchestras from other countries are scheduled to be in Korea to perform the German composer's masterpieces. Also, it is the 100th anniversary of the birth of modern Korean painter Park Soo-geun, so a number of museums and galleries are planning retrospectives. So these are just some of the events and performances that we'll be seeing throughout the year. Well, I think it all sounds very good and very nice. Um, I think I saw a survey somewhere that, you know, people who enjoy more arts and cultural events are happier in life. So hopefully we will see that here in this country as well. Thank you, Jiwon, for that report. Well, time now to get a check on the weather conditions, and for that, we have our Kim Bo-kyung at the Weather Center. Now, bo it was uh, warmer today compared to past days, but at the same time, it was uh, extremely dry, I must say. Well, that's no surprise, Kanyang, because dry weather advisories are in effect throughout the country. In fact, a dry weather alert has been issued in Gyeongsangnam-do province and the city of Ulsan. So, if you're in those regions, please watch out for fires. And of course, the all-important question, what about the weekend? Can we expect uh, weekend warriors to be outdoors enjoying the sun and of course the snow maybe in some countries, uh, some parts of the country, or should they just stay warm and cooped up inside?
Well, Daniel, temperatures have begun to rise, and it looks like numbers will remain in the seasonal averages on Saturday and Sunday. Now, it is recommended that you do any outdoor activities planned over this weekend because numbers will once again dip starting next Monday. Looking ahead at tomorrow's readings, Seoul starts off the day at minus 5 degrees with a high of 3. Meanwhile, Gwangju and Busan hit 5 and 7 degrees, respectively. Moving on to other regions, Jeju reaches 7 degrees while Tokdo and Mount Kimgang peak at 4 and minus 5 degrees respectively. Well, hope you have a wonderful weekend and I'll be back with more updates after 8. Thank you for that, Pogyoung. And that wraps up the news for us this hour and this week, of course. Thank you for watching. I'm Daniel Che. And I'm Moon Gwanyoung. Thank you, as always, for being here with us. Have a wonderful weekend and we will see you right back here same time Monday. Good night.